Since the late 2010s, the Future Flight team has been tracking the pioneers who are trying to electrify aviation. There's been plenty of hype, but also a lot of truly innovative momentum as well. And now, there's really no denying that the sector is at a turning point, because developing new aircraft is a hugely expensive business. And the fact is, not everyone's going to make it, as the bad news from two of the contenders in this sector has shown us in recent days. I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Hanneke Weitering, to get her thoughts on this unfolding situation. So on Friday, Lilium, the German Evertol aircraft developer, had to basically throw in the towel and file for insolvency for the second time in four months. A rescue package with new investors just never happened, as promised, and that almost certainly is the last we'll see of the eye-catching Lilium jet with its 30 ducted fan motors. But unfortunately, Hanukkah, that wasn't the only bad news, was it? Uh, perhaps you can tell us what's been happening with a company just up the road from you, a company called Eviation. Right. So Eviation is up here in Arlington, Washington, and they're developing this electric commuter airplane called Alice. And they, you know, more than two years after they did their first flight, not much has really been going on. And they just announced that they're pausing work and laying off 30 people which it's kind of hard to say exactly how much of their workforce that is. Uh, when I visited back in October 2024, Andre Stein, their CEO, said, you know, they have a kind of a mix of contractors and part-timers who come in. Um, they say maybe like 50 people a day were showing up. So now they're, they're looking for more investment, so they need to um, get some more money before they can get the ball rolling with this um, redesign of their electric aircraft. So, Charlie, what exactly happened with Lilium? Can you tell me how they ended up in a pickle? So, basically, uh, last year, I think it was uh, around the autumn, Lilium was having to try and line up loan guarantees. And you generally get loan guarantees from governments. So they went to the German federal government and also the Bavarian state government. And they had a deal in place where they were going to get 50 million euros from the federal government and once they got that, the Bavarians were going to say, fine, you can have another 50 million. So that would have been 100 million. That looked like it would all come together. But then the German parliament's budget committee, in a somewhat surprising move, didn't agree to that deal. And get this, my sources tell me it was actually a member of Germany's Green Party that cast the crucial vote against it. So paradoxically, you had the Green Party blocking this this support for you know what is supposedly a green aviation initiative once that uh, got blocked you know then they were in real trouble do we know by the same token Hanukkah what's exactly gone down at aviation I mean do we know specifically why they've run out of money or is that just not clear you know, it's honestly not that clear because I got the impression that this Clermont group, their their main shareholder, has been kind of funding everything in an unlimited fashion. But, you know, I guess it's not as unlimited as it seemed um, now that the Clermont group is looking for additional investment there. That's right. The version of the story that I've heard off the record, so I can't tell, tell you who told me this, is that Clermont has a 70 percent share in aviation, but it, which is a controlling share, of course. But there are other shareholders, and I believe they include some of the original Israeli investors who got this thing kicked off, you know, way back in 2015. And I get the impression, I, I wouldn't say they're at odds with each other, but there just isn't consensus as to what to do next. And I think it's pretty clear Claremont um, is looking for completely new people to come in. You know, Claremont is basically a real estate company, commercial real estate and medical solutions, among other things. You know, you have to wonder, did they really know just how costly it would be when they got into developing a whole new aircraft? Well, it's interesting with Eviation because their their original prototype was this kind of futuristic Jetsons looking airplane with like kind of an interesting shape. And it seems like there was some disagreement behind the scenes about whether this was actually a good design. And so they, they kind of redesigned the whole thing. They brought in this company called TLG Aerospace and their new design looks a lot more just like a regular electric airplane, you know, normal tube shaped airplane. So it's kind of lost some of that some of that like interesting look to it. But I think it probably makes more practical sense the way that they've redesigned it now. 
I, I think that's true. And, and I was told that the redesign in part was driven by what the, the prospective customers wanted, you know. So again, you might say, well, gee, maybe you should have got that straightened out before you spend a whole load of money developing the first version because you're burning through money with every change that you make. Things are quite different, I think, for Joby and Archer. I mean, you're following them and it seems like they attract plenty of money. Yeah, Joby and Archer are doing great, as far as I can tell at this point, um, probably better than some of the competition over in Europe, I'd say, with Volocopter and Vertical Aerospace having some, some financial troubles as well. Yeah, that's a great point. We should actually fill in the gaps there. So Volocopter is in something called pre-insolvency proceedings at the moment, which basically means that they're kind of on warning. Um, they keep assuring me that new money is just around the corner and that this could all be lined up within the next few weeks. But that's one we're going to have to watch. And you mentioned Vertical Aerospace. They're here in the UK with me. I mean, they're kind of OK for now. They lined up some extra finance uh, around the start of the year. But, you know, they're running pretty lean. So, Charlie, are these the only stumbling blocks we've seen in the electric aviation world lately? No, I wish I could say that they were. But um, it's, there's been a busy cycle of news here. So we're probably going back a week and a half now. Airbus, you know, a giant aerospace company, nothing like these startups that we've been talking about. It basically came, I was going to say came clean. They weren't trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. But they basically said, look, I know we told you we were going to get a hydrogen powered airliner into commercial service by 2035. But you know what? We've looked at it again, and it's just too hard. We're not going to be able to do that. And they're now saying it could take a minimum of five, if not ten years longer than they thought, to get the hydrogen-powered airliner into commercial service. They call it the Zero E program. The way they explained this was, look, it's not just a question of when our engineers can actually design and develop this new thing. We have to make sure that the industry is actually ready for it, that airports will have hydrogen fuel, that airlines will be ready to, to take this type of aircraft into their fleet. And it doesn't stop there, because around the same time, Airbus uh, basically said, look, we've been developing an EVATOL called the City Airbus Next Gen, and the fact is, we've decided we're going to pause development work on that. Now, the explanation here was a little different. They basically said, we just don't think the battery technology is ready. Um, you know, they, they'd looked at it and, and, and I guess decided, yes, we could develop an aircraft, but would it actually be viable? So I, I don't know what you think, Hedeka, but it seems to me that, you know, if a company like Airbus is now saying, actually, we don't think today's batteries are good enough, do you think that raises doubts about why they would be good enough for other companies like Joby and Archer and some of the other Evitol crowd? I would say it depends on the use cases, you know, air taxi versus longer distance. But I think one of the problems also is the infrastructure, like you mentioned with hydrogen. The ground infrastructure is not necessarily there to support electric aircraft at all these airports. You know, you need to be able to recharge. So I think I think we're going to see a push towards more hybrid propulsion systems before we get into the more electric. So, you know, you can go get fuel at an airport that already has fuel and not have to worry about whether there will be a charger where you're trying to fly to. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very wise observation, actually. I think we're going to see some pragmatism uh, going forward. You know, part of this maybe comes down to whether the FAA is actually has the capacity to do this. There's been a lot of questions lately about the FAA. How, how do you see that? I would say that the timeline probably depends a lot on the FAA, but I think we will get there. You know, maybe it'll take a couple more years than what we planned. But, you know, with so many of these different players in the electric aviation sphere, you know, we might see some consolidation with some of these smaller companies, you know, running out of money. It's it's an interesting time to be in the EV tall space for sure. Yeah, very definitely. And I might point out, by the way, I don't always make myself popular when I point this out, but, you know, in China, they've now got two EVATOL aircraft certified, the Ehang aircraft and a cargo EVATOL aircraft produced by Autoflight. And I was talking to a Chinese expert just last week, and he said, look, we're taking a really different approach from the West. You know, in the West, everything has to be absolutely 100% approved until we even allow it to happen. 
in China, basically the authorities are allowing them to be more incremental. So they'll give these companies their type certificate, but say, okay, now you have to prove you can have a production certificate, and then eventually we'll give you operating certificates. And it's hard for us to read this, but what it means is that companies like Ehang have been able to basically experiment with their aircraft much more widely. So it, it is a very different approach, but I, I don't know. I think my view overall is we're still going to be here in a few years' time writing about these companies. It just might be a somewhat different context. Well, Hanneke, thanks for sharing your insights. Uh, it's always good to look at this from both sides of the Atlantic. I appreciate uh, your comments there, and thanks for joining us. Happy to be here, Charlie. Thank you. Excellent. Well, believe it or not, Hanneke and I actually get paid for covering this advanced technology world that's transforming aviation and changing the way people fly. So if you have an insatiable appetite for this type of story, keep coming back. We have new, fresh news just about every day. You'll find all of that at AINonline.com slash futureflight. <laughs>